So good morning, my name is Diana Pinheiro and I've just recently started my group at the Vienna Biocenter at IMP and in my lab we're really interested in understanding the molecular and biophysical mechanisms through which patterns and shapes emerge during early embryonic development. So I think this cartoon here of how to fold a simple sheet of paper into an origami dinosaur really exemplifies many of the conceptual features of early embryonic development. On one hand, you can see the gradual increase in complexity until you actually have an adult that is properly formed and properly shaped. And you can also appreciate how different sections of the paper will become fated into different structures, for example, the head or the tail, and how they're folded into their correct final form. We cannot really easily study dinosaurs or origami tyrannosaurs, but we can definitely study how these processes occur in embryos. And we can ask ourselves how cells and tissues know which structures they should become. So how do they become a head structure or a tail? And also which mechanical forces act on cells and tissues to shape them into their final um, form. And there are two key differences between origami and embryos because in embryos everything is self-organized. So they have to organize themselves into the correct patterns and the correct forms and they do this in a very reproducible manner. So how actually cells and embryos are able to do this is something that we are fascinated about. And so to give you a more example of how actual embryos look like, I will show you here a movie of an embryo from zebrafish, which is a great model system to study early embryonic development because zebrafish lays the eggs in the water and fertilization occurs external to the body. These embryos are also very transparent, so it's really easy for us to image all the processes that occur during embryogenesis using live cell microscopy. Here I'm now showing you an example of an embryo of zebrafish starting at four hours post-fertilization. On the left you can see all the cell nuclei in grey and on the right hand side you can see the same nuclei but now they're color coded according to the tissues that they will give rise to. So in blue we have ectoderm, in red it will appear, we'll have mesoderm and in green endoderm. And what you can appreciate once this movie starts playing is just the complexity of this process. On one hand cells are changing colors, which means that they're acquiring different fates, but they're also doing a number of other things, right? There's a number of cell divisions, cells rearrange, they change their shape. And at the tissue scale you can also see that a lot of things are happening. So there's extension along one axis, there's convergence. And by the end of the movie you start to see something that looks like a fish, where you have a head structures emerge, you can already tell apart some somites and the emergence of the tail. And so all of this takes only a couple of hours. This movie really illustrates two key features uh, in addition of early embryonic development. It's really a multi-scale process. Things are happening at the subcellular scale, at the cell scale and at the tissue scale to completely reshape and pattern these embryos, but it's also a really dynamic process. Over the last years, we've learned about the key signaling pathways in gene regulatory networks that generate patterning, as well as the mechanical forces and cellular processes that shape developing embryos, which we call morphogenesis. But we know much less about how these two key programs are actually integrated during development. And you can really think of embryogenesis as a triple challenge. You have on one hand to make the right cell types, they have to reach the final correct locations, but the two things also need to be coordinated. So how is this achieved? So now that we have a clear question, I introduced our model system, we also need to choose a process. And during the start of my postdoc, I, started, I chose to study this question in the process of gastrulation. Why gastrulation? Because it's the first instance during development where tissue specification, so tissues acquiring different fates, occurs in parallel with large-scale morphogenetic movements that completely reshape the embryo. And also, very beautifully put by Louis Olpert, it's not really birth, marriage or death that is truly the most important moment of your life, but really gastrulation, so that you can have a life. And so in zebrafish, gastrulation starts at what we call 50% epiboli, when the embryonic cells have covered around half of this very big yolk cell. And as time goes by and gastrulation proceeds, the embryonic cells cover more and more this big yolk cell until it's completely enveloped by embryonic cells. In zebrafish, gastrulation lasts around five hours. In humans, it lasts for a week. Despite the difference in developmental timing, 
the key signaling pathways, molecular processes and mechanical forces that act during zebrafish castration are actually very similar to those acting in humans, making zebrafish a really good model to understand the fundamental process of embryonic development. And so at the start of gastrulation in zebrafish, at the interface between the embryonic cells and the yolk, there is a gradient of nodal signaling that is formed. You can visualize this gradient here as a gradient of nuclear accumulation of SMAT2, which is the downstream effector of nodal. And nodal is a member of the TGF beta family and it signals via SMAT complexes to activate transcription of key genes for the patterning of the different germ layers, in particular mesendoderm and mesoderm genes. Nodal was proposed to function as a morphogen, so the idea is that um, it will trigger cell responses in a concentration dependent manner, such that cells that are here at the edge of the tissue and have the highest levels of phosphosmat2 will become fated to endoderm, whereas cells that receive intermediate levels of signaling will become mesoderm, and cells that receive very low levels of signaling will become ectoderm. And so basically, using this gradient, cells will acquire different fates, and soon after these beautiful patterns are laid down at the start of the process, morphogenesis kicks in, and you can see that it completely reshapes the entire embryo. And if you focus here in the schematics, you can see that the mesendoderm tissue that is specified within the margin will undergo internalization. This is really important because endoderm and mesoderm cells will give rise to internal organs such as the gastrointestinal tract, the blood or the heart. So those are all internal organs. So everything needs to be on the inside. Once cells have internalized here, then they will rapidly migrate towards the anterior and they will acquire their final position along the forming body axis. So when I started my postdoc, I was really fascinated by this process and I had two main questions. On one hand, how are these morphogenetic movements regulated across scales? So how do you make all of these cells go to the inside of the embryo and then suddenly change direction and go towards the anterior? And on the other hand, what happens to these robust tissue patterns that are actually imprinted in the tissue at the start of the process? So you go from something that is totally static like this to something that is really dynamic. So how actually these two processes are integrated? And so to tackle this question, the first thing we did was to just try to image the process of internalization. And here you can see in green a mesendodermal marker in green and a nuclear marker in magenta. And this is basically a cross-section through the embryo. You can see here the cells, and here in the dashed line you have this marginal region, so the interface between the embryonic part and the yolk cell. And if you focus here on the color code of these arrows, keep in mind that lighter colors are closer to the margin and darker colors are further away from the margin. And when I play this movie, what you will see is how ordered the whole process actually is. So basically cells that are initially very close, they internalize earlier than cells that are located further away from the margin. And this is something that you can quantify and you get this very nice linear relationship. So there is basically one simple rule, first cell in, first cell out. So the first cells to go in are also the first to start migrating upwards. Why is this so interesting? Well, if you have such tight coupling between the position of the cells and the timing of internalization, you're basically just translating the gradient from the outside to the inside. And this is exactly what we saw when we plotted the position of cells at the start of internalization and an hour after, this is data from six embryos, you can see that the color code kind of stays together. The light cells or the cells that were here initially, they tend to stay together an hour later and the darker cells also tend to stay together. What this means is that the relative position of cells is actually preserved through the process of internalization. And here it's the average across these different um, six embryos. And so the idea is that by coupling the position with the timing of internalization at the cell scale, what the embryo is able to do is to make the tissue scale movements very ordered and preserve those patterns through internalization. This sounds very intuitive, but it raises a very obvious question, which is how do you achieve such precise timing of internalization at the cell scale? And this is particularly tricky when you imagine that you have now over a thousand cells that are internalizing and this occurs over a two hour time window. It's a fully 3D process, so all around the circumference of the embryo, and the difference in timing of internalization of cells that are neighbors is only a few minutes.
So we had this question and we thought perhaps cells have some sort of timer. Maybe they wait until they reach the margin to actually start internalizing. And so to test this idea, we did a system of transplantations, which were inspired by classical embryology experiments. And the idea is that we collected wild type cells at different stages of gastrulation, always at the marginal region. And we transplanted these cells into a mutant embryo here that lacks both mesoderm and internalization movements. And we watch how these transplanted cells internalize in each case. And so the idea was that we could really discriminate what is the autonomous migratory capacity of the donor cells versus any collective effects that happen during normal gastrulation movement. And here, I think an easy analogy to visualize what is the challenge if you think about a flock of sheep, for example. If you want to see what each sheep can do and you put it in the the middle of this collective is very hard to actually discriminate the capacity of each ship to move but on the other hand you can also take one of those place it in separately in another part of your field and analyze how it behaves so it's exactly the same idea now if i go back to this idea of the timer now we have this experimental setup what do we expect so what we expect is that all transplanted cells should internalize with similar dynamics if the timer model is correct why? Because regardless of developmental stage, we always took cells at the time and position where they're about to undergo internalization. So it's kind of a way to synchronize cells. So what did we actually found? So this is now the early cells here collected from 50%. You can really appreciate that these cells initially are here on the surface, but by the end of the movie, they have translocated to the inside of the embryo. So what happens at later stages? Well, to our surprise, we saw that at later stages, cells do not internalize at all. So here, this is where they start, and you see that they pretty much stay in the same position until the end of the movie. And we were very puzzled by this observation. It was quite reproducible, so when we compared the behavior, we saw that really early cells, by the end of gastrulation, most of the cells had internalized, but this was really not the case for later cells. And so this was not consistent with the timer model, and it rather suggested that there's a window of time during which cells are capable of undergoing internalization. And it seems like this window is closed actually very early in the process by mid to late shield stage, which is this stage here. We, of course, had a small paradox because we could see that in our transplantations, the later mesendoderm cells could not go to the inside. But in the actual embryo, I told you all the mesendoderm cells have to go to the inside because they give rise to internal organs. So how could we reconcile our observations in the transplants versus what we see in vivo? And so what we thought that could explain both observations is that maybe everything is much more collective than we thought. And perhaps these early cells here, those that can internalize in the transplants by themselves, are able to somehow drive later cells to the inside of the embryo. To test this idea, what we did was to collect in the same transplant the early cells, so the putative leader cells, and these later cells, the putative followers. And we ask if we combine later cells with early cells, can now all of the cells go to the inside of the embryo? And this is one of such transplants. These are the later cells here, and these that are a little bit light at the beginning, but will become more green are the early cells. And what you can appreciate is that by the end of the movie, the entire cluster has now moved to the inside of the embryo. If you look at how this actually happens, you can see that the early cells are the first ones to reach the inside of the embryo, and the later cells are a little bit like cargo at the back, and eventually they reach the inside of the embryo. And this is the quantification. All of this suggests that indeed the early cells are able to somehow drive the rest of the mesoderm cells towards the inside of the embryo consistent with this idea that the process is collective. And raising, of course, the next question, which is what actually makes the difference uh, between leaders and follower cells, both at the molecular level and also at the bi biophysical level. We had some hints from previous work because we knew that active migration forces are important for mesoderm internalization. So that gave us kind of a hint of where to look and we had two potential hypothesis. Maybe the later cells have no directionality. Maybe they don't know that they have to go to the inside of the embryo, or maybe they just cannot move. So one of the two, which one is it? To test it, we repeated the same transplants as before, but now we labeled not the nuclei, but instead we labeled the protrusions of those cells using life act, which labels F-actin. And what you can see here in the image and also in the quantification is that we found that all the cells 
early or later cells were still always oriented towards the inside of the embryo. So zero would be perfectly inside. So you can see that they have very similar orientation of their protrusions. So this does not seem consistent with the first hypothesis. So what about the second hypothesis? When we counted the number of protrusions formed by these cells over time, we see that there is kind of a decline. The early cells form the biggest number of protrusions and this basically decreases in time. Now if we zoom in at the transition point, so remember the early cells go in and the late cells stay out, if we focus here at the transition point where they lose the ability to internalize, we see a difference of protrusion number that is around twofold. So we asked, is that enough? Because the protrusion difference is twofold, but the difference in internalization competence is almost zero one. And so I will cut a, a very long story short. We found that this is the case. So when we overexpressed low levels of dominant negative RAC in the early cells, what we do is basically we reduce slowly their average number of protrusions, not to zero, but we just reduce it. But that has a dramatic effect in the internalization capacity of those cells. So rather than internalizing almost in 100% of the cases, now they only internalize in around 20% of the cases. So protrusions are really important and cells are really sensitive because here the difference is even less than twofold. And still we see a very drastic difference in internalization capacity. Now, okay, so the difference in protrusion number is important, but how is it encoded? And what we saw is if we looked again at this nodal signaling that I discussed at the beginning by looking at the accumulation of active SMAT23 complexes in the nucleus, what we saw is that actually the early cells have the highest amounts of nodal signaling, but the gradient kind of goes down in time, with later cells having less and less nodal signaling. So of course the obvious question is, if we would upregulate nodal signaling in the late cells, could they now start to internalize. So that's what we did. And you can see here that now they become more protrusive. And in that case, a higher proportion of those cells is able to internalize. So that seems consistent. And this is really about protrusions because when we take later cells over expressing nodal and we also block their ability to form protrusions, now none of the cells can internalize. So we can really convert lead the cells into followers or vice versa by playing directly with cellular number of protrusions or nodal signaling, which in turn regulates these protrusions. Now, when I put all of these different manipulations together, what you might also have noticed is that we have quite small changes in the number of protrusion per cell, but we always have quite dramatic differences in their capacity to internalize. So the, the responses don't really seem linear. And so that to us was suggestive of a process that was described theoretically and explored in vitro as well, called motility-driven unjamming. And the idea is that the state of your tissue can change depending on a number of parameters, including the magnitude of your motility forces. So if the cells have very high motility forces, they can always drive rearrangements and they can displace within the tissue. So they have a high mean square displacement, which is said to make a tissue sort of fluid-like because it's easy to displace. On the other hand, if your motility forces are low, well, that makes it very hard to drive rearrangement, so you don't exchange position with your neighbors. And basically, this is what we call cage motion. So if you follow these cells in time, they always stay in the same position. And this is a bit akin to a more solid-like behavior. So if I want to give you a more of an intuition of what that means in real terms. So you could imagine that being jammed is a bit like being in a brick wall. You can barely displace. And being in an unjump state is more like being plain dough. It's very easy to change your shape. So what, what does this have anything now to do with what I saw before? Well, the idea is that perhaps our leader cells, they are above that critical value of motility forces. So they can drive those rearrangements and they can internalize. So they can be said to be unjumped. Whereas the follower cells, they are below the threshold. So they're stuck. They cannot displace within the tissue. Now, the key parameter to measure, to test if this could apply is really this value here for the mean square displacement. And that's what we did. And here you can see the mean square displacement for the early cells is very high. We expect that because these cells internalize, so they have to displace within the tissue. Now, what was really interesting is what we found for the follower cells. So here you can see that over the time scale of hours, these cells barely displace within the tissue. And here the dashed line indicates one cell diameter, which indicates that over the time scale of hours, these cells basically don't move. So they say exactly where they were placed, consistent with cage motion and jammed like state. So now can we go a little bit further and use this analogy to actually predict 
what happens between all of our different experiments more quantitatively. And so for that, we teamed up with Eduard Nenzo. He's a theoretical physicist working at IST Austria. And he modeled the process of motility driven and jamming as an energy landscape. And there's two stable states outside or inside. To change state, the magnitude of your protrusive forces needs to be high enough that you can actually go over the energy barrier and go into the internal state. One important parameter is that protrusive force or number of protrusions is not an absolute measurement. If you measure it in time, there's variation. So we integrated the stochasticity that we observe in the protrusions across all conditions, which we took around 20%. As you see, it fits quite well all of the conditions. When we do that and we model this process, we get a phase diagram that has three regions. When the cells have very low protrusive forces, they never go in. When they have very high protrusive forces, they always go in. And around the critical point, around 1.5, things start to become very variable because now, even if you are close to the threshold but you have a bit of noise, you can actually transition. But on the other hand, you can also get stuck. And so basically things become much more variable. And this is really nice because it fits very well with what we observed. Now this is all the data points that I've shown you before, discriminated by experiment. And you can see when the cells have very low protrusions, they never make it. When they have very high, they essentially always make it. And around this 1.5, you can see some cases where the cells don't make it and some cases where they internalize completely. So you really see this variability of outcomes. And if you average all the different time points together, and all the different conditions, you can see now that there's a very nice agreement between the model and the data, really supporting the idea that the gradient of nodal signaling regulates protrusiveness and internalization capacity by triggering a motility-driven and jamming transition. And so what we thought was very interesting about this kind of model is that it allows the embryo to convert something that is graded at the molecular level, so nodal is graded, but also cellular protrusions are graded, into a binary mechanical switch that give rise to two populations of leaders and follower cells. Now, everything I've told you was in the transplantation case, and I started by saying that I wanted to understand the movements at the tissue scale. So did we actually learn anything from these transplants that can help us to describe the movements in the embryo in vivo? And so again, with Eduard Nenzo, we now modeled what happens in the embryo and tried to simulate the events. And so here you we have we use the 2D particle-based model. Each particle meant, is meant to represent a cell, and they are arranged in a configuration that looks very similar to what we see in the embryo. We have three main forces, just to mimic what happens in the embryo. We have these forces here called epiboli that spread the cells downwards. We have internalization forces. And once the cells are inside, they start to migrate upwards. So all of this is exactly what we see in vivo. Now, what is the key ingredient of the model? Well, we input the nodal signaling gradient that we measure experimentally, and we assume a linear relationship between the internalization forces and nodal levels. What does this make? It means that only the cells that have very peak nodal signaling levels, so very high signaling, have sufficiently strong motility forces to unjam and actually initiate tissue movement. So what happens? Well, what you can see here is that even though we have very few of those leader cells, that's actually sufficient to drive internalization of a huge number of follower cells, just like we see in vivo. And when we looked at how ordered the processes in the simulations and in vivo, we saw a very nice agreement between the model and our data. Consistent with the idea that the gradient of nodal signaling enforces a spatial temporal pattern of leaders and follower cells. This is very important because only the leader cells that can unjam can initiate tissue movements. So you always start internalizing where your leader cells are positioned, so at this single location. Now, okay, we have a model, it seems to represent what we see in vivo, but can we make any predictions that we can test experimentally? And so what we really were interested in doing was manipulating the shape of the gradient of nodal signaling in vivo. And so for that, we turned to maternal zygotic mutants for Lefty, which is the inhibitor of nodal signaling. And it was previously described, and we also saw the same, that in Lefty mutants, the gradient of nodal signaling is expanded. 
And if you look at the quantification here, you can also see that now, rather than having a very fast decay of signaling from the margin, there's multiple cell rows that have very high nodal signaling. Now, based on what I've told you before, the prediction is that if we have more cells with very high nodal signaling, we should also have more leader cells. So if we go back to the simulations, and the only parameter that we change is we use the gradient of nodal signaling in the lefty mutants rather than the wild type, this automatically gives rise to higher number of leader cells because the assumptions are not changed. And so what happens to tissue movements? What you can see is that the whole thing is now much more messy. There's a large fraction of the tissue that internalizes in parallel because all these cells are so high in motility that they can all start internalizing at the same time. And the relative position of the cells is completely lost. So you don't have this rule anymore of first in, first out, because now it's super hard for these cells at the edge of the tissue to actually start moving upwards and migrating to the anterior side of the embryo. So can we actually now look at the embryos and does it look anything like the simulations? So this is an embryo. In fact, it does look very similar. So it's the same color code as before. Mesenoderm is in green and nuclei is labeled in magenta. You see there is, at the start of the process, there is a large fraction of cells that internalize in parallel much more than in vivo. And if you look at the arrows and the color code, you see that now being at the front makes it actually really difficult to start migrating upwards. And so the relative position of cells is completely lost. And this can again be quantified and the match between the model and the data is very good, but it's no longer aligned with this diagonal as in the wild type before. So really supporting that the relative position of cells is lost and the patterning that was laid down at the start of gastrulation is now lost during tissue movements. And so this suggests that not only the gradient of nodal signaling is really important to create a gradient of motility, but the shape of the gradient is really important because it sets the proportion of leader to follower cells, which is the key parameter to initiate tissue movement in a very ordered manner which is then essential to preserve the patterns through large-scale morphogenesis. And we found that the gradient of nodal signaling is actually uh, giving rise to a gradient of motility within the tissue such that cells that receive peak nodal signaling are able to unjam and initiate tissue internalization. Now, what I didn't have time to show you, however, is that we found that the gradient of nodal signaling is actually also used to allow the leader cells to be coupled to the correct followers. And this is really important because once the tissue has started to internalize, cells still need to keep track of which followers they need to pull. And of course, it's like a train, you want to pull the carriage behind you, but once the tissue has started to fold, it's really important to minimize adhesion across this forming tissue boundary here. And so the cells also use nodal for that. And we thought that this was quite interesting because it means that the gradient of nodal signaling that so far we thought was only used to encode different cell fates, it's also used to encode a number of complex mechanical properties in these progenitors to allow them to be correctly segregated in time. And it's really a dual process because on one hand, we have motility that I discussed extensively that initiates tissue movement, but we also have a role for nodal signaling in regulating adhesion within the follower cells. And in particular, this idea that differences in adhesion, and this we call heterotypic adhesion, are emerging now both theoretically and experimentally as a really good mechanism to enforce tissue segregation. So we're really excited into pursuing that a bit further. And so here we really have a morphogen gradient that patterns the tissue, instructs the mechanics, which in turn acts to preserve the patterns that were initially laid down. And so this could be a general principle to couple patterning and morphogenetic programs across all scales. Now, what are the next questions that emerge from this work? So now we found indeed that morphogens or signaling can couple pattern and morphogenetic programs, but of course the question remains how? How exactly do you have a signal that can induce cell fates, but it can also induce mechanical forces? And so the short answer we don't know and we have to investigate. I would say that the idea in the field has been that biochemical signaling or morphogen signaling induces different cell fates. These cell fates come with specific mechanical properties that basically gives rise to morphogenesis. So it's a very unidirectional and rigid view. 
So most of the community has, of course, focused in trying to understand the first arrow, how signaling gives rise to different cell fates and different tissue patterns. However, both from our work and also work that is emerging now, we know now that signaling also regulates mechanical forces. We know that not necessarily these two things always match. So it really raises the question of can we really use this very unidirectional view to explain how embryonic development occurs? And to slightly complexify the picture even further, now there's data emerging also suggesting that mechanical forces can directly trigger cell fate, so not at all positioned in downstream of signaling, but as a driver of cell fates, and also they can affect signaling. So now if we want to dissect how each of these arrows are actually acting during embryonic development, we need to have control. So for that we need to have manipulations that are precise both on the signaling and on the mechanical level. And what is really exciting about this time now is that we have a number of optogenetic tools that can allow us just that. There's also biophysical manipulations that are becoming more and more used and also live cell reporters of signaling so that we can relate the events across all scales from the molecular scale at the signaling level to the cellular responses that cells actually do and at the tissue scale how this affects pattern and morphogenesis and zebrafish is a really good organism to couple all of these different scales together also because it allows us to image and visualize what's happening in the embryo and now we're also very excited to compare and contrast what we find in the zebrafish to the gastroloids, which are colonies of human embryonic stem cells that we can keep in the dish and induce them to sort of gastrolate, so they can be induced to specify into the different germ layers upon addition of a very specific factor, BMP4, and so we can now compare and contrast what happens in different species. And so I would just like to finish by acknowledging the lab where I've done my postdoc, and in particular my supervisor, Cab Philip Eisenberg, our collaborations, and these people here, they contributed a lot to the work as well, our funding agencies, and now I'm really excited to start my group, and I really want to thank also these brave people that took on the adventure of, with me to start our work and they are working both in zebrafish and into the human gastroloids. And thank you very much for your attention.